Um, and we move on to our next uh, talk. Um, our next speaker, David Burke, is a PhD student and associate lecturer at Bath Spa University, focusing on heavy metal music and culture. His work incorporates media studies, musicology, and cultural sociology alongside critical theory, continental philosophy, and psychoanalysis, aiming to expose vernacular practices in metal culture that help its longevity and continuity. His work has been published in Metal Music Studies and the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of Popular Music of the World, and he's presented papers at the London Conference of Critical Theory and the International Society of Metal Music Studies, among others. David draws directly on his own experience as a metal musician, events promoter, and journalist in his work, and he currently performs with a Bristol-based doom metal band, Warrior Pope. The presentation that follows will, he says, refer to some violent imagery describing the cadaver synod. And there will also be moments of singing, which we expect to be loud. And we look forward all the more um, to his talk titled Heavy Metal Gimmickry with Warrior Pope. Ah, welcome, greetings everybody. I sure hope that you brought your little notebooks and your papers. And there are handouts under the seats, don't you know? Look under your chair right now. I guarantee you that there's a handout. Yes, indeed. We will be talking today about my time in Warrior Pope. That was part of the character that um, I do as part of the band. And let's go. So. Um, oh God, where's the what, where's the present button when you need it? Right, so heavy metal gimmickry with Warrior Pope. The font choice was intentional. So I want to kind of set the scene first contextually. So some of the kind of concepts that we'll be dealing with here are metal as a bricolage, um, a postmodern kind of recombination of symbols and images that cohere around specific themes, including pre-modernity. And these are often used as a source of grounding or substantiality or authenticity. However, at the same time, method is also known for its playful approach to subject matter, which in some cases is merely silly, but in others allows musicians to disavow their own controversial rhetoric in what Khan Harris, Key Khan Harris calls re um, reflexive anti-reflexivity. Um, there are, of course, some historical specialists who also have bands, people that properly engage with the source material, but the dominant, the more dominant, as, as we've been kind of going through this conference, a lot, a lot of what's uh, uh, published regarding uh, metal music that engages with pre-modernity, it's not necessarily a, a kind of rigorous scholarly engagement. I also want to emphasize that pre-modernity is utilized by metal bands as a means of grounding, as I said, in a world which doesn't really have clear grounding. I, I've already I've contended elsewhere that this is a uh, metal's essentially contradictory relationship to post-modernity. Um, I would also advise seeing some of the works of Carl Spracklin, Simon Poole, and Brad Klitschak. So in recent years, the number of bands which utilize novelties and gimmicks in their album artworks, names, and performance features has dramatically increased. I'm talking about the past uh, 10 to 15 years, really. Of course, there are precedents for this. You know, there have been a, there's a whole history of uh, bands that engage in what was originally called shock rock, um, and here are some of the kind of greats of these styles, so Screaming Lord Such, Kiss, Alice Cooper, and Screaming Jay Hawkins, um, who kind of set the stage for a very elaborate, performative, theatrical approach to doing rock music. And then in the 80s, we get bands um, like Guar, and uh, also in the UK, a band called Lawnmower Death. And then later we get other comedy, sort of comedic bands, um, such as in the 2000s, there was a band called Psycho Stick. Now, these bands were outliers when they started. They were, they were able to be the comedy band for their generation or for their particular locality. But there was just kind of, there, were one, there was a kind of one per whole metal culture, as it were. There weren't too many of these at the time. Um, and now there's a modern crop of novelty extreme metal bands, which are less explicitly about jokes or comedy, and they're more focused on using particular cultural references as aesthetic dressing for conventional extreme metal styles. So these include, and I apologize to Rowan Atkinson for this, but, um, oh, there's Psycho Stick, by the way. Um, here we go. So Party Cannon, 
Raised by Owls, Thrasher Tui, Two Man Doom Band, Gimli Son of Gloin is a, just a band about Gimli. Uh, there's a there's a band about being a, a construction worker called Pint Glass. There's um and there, there's a band uh, about Nicolas Cage called Cage. Uh, there's a Harry Potter themed black metal band called Slytherin. They're all out there. And lastly, of course, um, we've got Shred Dibna. For those fans of uh, Northern England in all its forms, you'll notice a real life chimney really promise on the in, in the middle of their set. OK, so we should differentiate these from bands that use costumes and ritual elements within the aesthetic conventions of their genres, such as doom metal bands using fog and robes or black metal bands using corpse paint or candles. While these performance techniques are similar, the way novelty bands generate their differentiation is by diverting from established aesthetic stereotypes relating it to their genre. I claim this is due to what I would call genre saturation. As Mark Fisher has observed, since the 2000s, genre innovation in popular music has winnowed significantly. In metal, there have been a few minor subgenre innovations, including gent, black gaze, and trap metal, but these are fusions rather than being new styles in their own right. Concomitant with this relative stasis compared to the 1960s to 1990s period of significant innovation, the number of bands playing with each, within each fusion genre has massively increased. The gaps have been filled out, as it were. Novelty thus emerges as a strategy of differentiation within crowded markets. Adding a gimmick or a comedic twist to an established sound enables a band to be noticed more quickly. The ubiquity of social media plays an important role in this effect. Bands are not only trying to create a novel sound, a task we could infer as being increasingly difficult, but also are competing as media properties with images, posts, video clips, and easily printed merchandise. And because bands are more visible than before, the ubiquity of social media, creating a novel aesthetic or performative aspects that can be seen online becomes more important. We might also consider that being able to access the complete works of every previous metal band by the internet has a sort of demythologizing effect. It becomes abundantly clear that in many cases, musicians are not exceptionally talented and attempting to be the greatest of all time is actually very difficult. This opens up the possibility of kind of settling for a gimmick which will differentiate one's band without having to become the, you know, the next in Ray Malmsteen or whoever you want to mention. I will now explore this a bit further through my own experiences in a band called Warrior Pope. Oh, we'll get there. I was I was the singer and trombonist for this band from October 2022 until February 24, so just, just recently. And we played uh, nearly 10 gigs in that time period. When I joined the band, the leader pitched a concept to me concerning the Cadaver Synod, which was an event in late 9th century papal history, wherein the Pope Formosus's corpse was put on trial by a subsequent Pope, Stephen the sixth convicted and deconsecrated and this decision was later reversed the whole affair reflects the sordid intrigues of state and clerical power immediately before the founding of the holy roman empire and as was mentioned throughout my tenure with the band had quote game of thrones vibes which i will return to as a phrase when this was pitched the band leader said he was interested in writing about forms of death or suitably metal historical events that had not been covered extensively by metal musicians this in itself is seeking novelty, but is less overtly gimmicky. Composers largely avoid being seen as copyists. Homage, yes. Outright plagiarism, no. The lyrics I wrote about this topic are played straight. They're not, they're not comedic. I based my research on Wikipedia and followed a few references back and also used some dramatic license. Although I'm an academic and so I'm familiar with rigorous uh, research processes, I was not sufficiently invested to delve too deeply, and so my lyric writing process may, may bear similarities to other metal songwriters for whom history is mediated rather than researched. However, my training as a historian in current studies also informed a level of criticality in the lyrics which may be anomalous, but that's uh, for interpretation. Once the band was ready to perform, we began adding novelty elements, pretty intuitively, partly as a result of the band leader being a big Guar fan, and partly due to my openness to engaging in performative gimmicks where previous singers had been less interested. The notion that we were doing novelties as a way to stand out from other bands was downplayed within the band's discourse, I claim, due to the deflationary effect that this was entailing. Rather than seeing gimmicks as a bit of fun, framing them as marketing devices would remove the band members from a state of group flow, and also mirth, we're, we're trying to enjoy this. 
My trombone playing, which I uh, which I do, was by default considered a novelty due to its deviance from the conventional metal band instrumentation of guitars, drums, vocals. Similarly, the band already used incense sticks at gigs, which although can be considered a novelty, is fairly common among doom metal bands. And indeed, the band leader referred to the Warrior Pope uh, repeatedly as a robes and fog band. This is an example of what I would call conventional novelty, which would be less successful at differentiation. The main gimmick I developed is a metatextual performance where I use the character of a university lecturer. And to aid this, I wear this brown sports jacket. I couldn't be bothered to put elbow patches on though. And I use books as props at some gigs. This is derived from my own experience as a lecturer and from my relation to the band itself. When I joined the group, I made it explicit I was conducting research through participation. So I exaggerated and accentuated this into performance features as you've already experienced. For a photo shoot, this character was extended to the band by a series of photographs where we read books and lectured to each other like so. Additional live gimmicks took shape following our first gig. At the second show, I threw some hot dogs into the audience to represent Pope Formosus's severed ordinating fingers. But this posed problems. The guitarist nearly slid and fell on a fallen sausage, and I was asked to clean up the remains after the show, which I did find very unpleasant. In this moment, I became aware of the limits of live gimmickry relative to one's production budget. The more grotesque and tactile novelties often require significant support from a production team, as well as investment on part of the band. See Gua and their uh, pit industry thing. They have a whole team of people working around them. Um, the band leader was keen to create a complex stage show involving costumes in a collaboration with a friend who would play Pope Formosus's corpse. This took months of planning and consultation with another friend who had been qualified in dressmaking, culminating in a Halloween show. Um, yes, there it is, featuring the band fully costumed, bearing a large wooden crucifix and a thurible constructed from two metal colanders with some lights and incense sticks inside. The Pope was brought to the stage in a wheelchair that covered in some curtains to resemble a throne. The band leader's original plan was more innate but not realised, and also had fog machines rigged underneath. At this show and at my final performance with the band, our set began with a procession to the stage accompanied by backing track gathering concert goers as we went. In these performances, my character of lecturer was replaced by playing a mad priest or witch finder, a character commonly utilised in Doom Metal C. Owen Coggins' paper on that. It could be argued that this stage show was a more elaborated form of robes and fog, an extended conventional novelty, while my performance as lecturer is arguably a little more kind of out there, a little more novel. It should be stressed. There's the thurible, by the way. Oh, actually, have I got? Let me um. Let me quickly put the clip up for you. I think there's uh, I think there's time for the clip. Um. Oh God, where's it gone? There we go. Right. <laughs> presentation um, <laughs> um but i think it was very important that you all saw that um so it should be stressed that warrior pope and many other novelty bands carry out these elaborated performances as independent unsigned bands playing to relatively small audiences and mostly losing money in the process in addition to making performative strategic moves within metal subgenres, which are increasingly crowded, 
The rise of novelty bands should also be understood as one way in which metal scenes are increasingly professionalized at the DIY or underground level of cultural production. Um, I previously talked about a kind of spectrum between undergroundism and professionalism in metal bands. This can also be seen in the increasing varieties of merchandise marketed by small bands, the professional tone of the majority of their social media posts, the complexity and cost of many uh, underground musicians' equipment, and various performance features maintained by many underground bands which mimic those of bands who play to much larger audiences. They will address their crowd as if they're playing at a much bigger gig than they are. In effect, seeing a local or DIY novelty band is akin to watching a more commercially successful band with extensive stage show, but with easier accessibility and a lower cost for the attendees. This will perhaps become more important in the way tribute bands have become a notable part of the live music economy. Both stand in for live music experiences, which have become inaccessible for reasons of economy and age of the original performers. You know, you can't see Kiss very easily now, but you can come down and see a local band that does, does something that's a bit like Kiss, or, or we were doing something that's a bit like somewhere between Guar and Batushka, I guess. Finally, I will consider how novelty bands contribute to heavy metal's relationship with global pre-modernity. Some novelty bands will relate to the past in a nostalgic frame and thereby run the risk of uncritically utilizing historic cultures. And others may use global pre-modernity as a trove of signifiers to create a syncretic authenticity as suggested by Walser concerning Iron Maiden in, in, um, in his chapter. My experience in Warrior Pope indicates the possibility of a reflexive engagement with pre-modernity within a metal band context, as I was able to engage with scholarly source material and approach the task of writing lyrics with an academic framing to some extent, though I think this was probably mediated by my experience in academia. So this is limit this may be limited to people who are already in that kind of frame. My performance as a lecturer also allowed me to satirize pedagogical stereotypes to some extent, as you saw. However, the playfulness of novelty bands has the overall effect of reinforcing the gulf between our current postmodernity and the inaccessible pre-modernity which led us here. The act of parody or satire always involves taking some critical distance from its object, even if it also gather involves gathering detailed information about what you are satirizing. The Game of Thrones vibe phrase is important to consider here. In the video, I think you may have heard people shouting shame as in the, the scene from Game of Thrones, I think, is what they were referring to there. It is precisely through this mass-mediated fantasy fiction that we can attempt to understand pre-modernity, but this also necessarily reveals the impasse therein. In this sense, novelty bands which engage with pre-modernity formally reflect what for other bands is often reflected in the content. Our attempt to authenticity turn to ashes in our hands. What we're dealing with here, I want to follow Keith Conn Harris's idea of, of reflexive anti-reflexivity. What I want to suggest here is that we deal with a kind of authentic in uh, oh, that's sorry, the other way around, an inauthentic authenticity is what we're dealing with um, in a lot of bands that work with pre-modernity, but also especially heightened in the form of the gimmick or novelty band. Thanks very much.